right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Strawberry Chat. My name is Miranda Purcell. I'm the Viticulture Extension Specialist at Purdue University. Our topic is day neutral strawberry production. My name is Wen Jing. I'm the Horticulture Specialist at Purdue. And as Miranda said, our topic today is day neutral strawberry production. Our guests are from Minnesota. I will let them introduce themselves and also Richard, our old friend. I wanted to thank you for the invite. It's always fun to talk about strawberries together. Um, so Mary Rogers, I'm a researcher at the University of Minnesota. I've been working with day neutral strawberries for um, close to close to 10 years since I've been here. Uh, but I also work in vegetable systems. So fruit and vegetable production for local and organic markets kind of broadly. And um, uh, a lot of my work involves hort horticultural entomology. So I'm an entomologist by training. So I kind of do a little bit of both horticulture and entomology. My name is Andy Petran. I own Twin Cities Berry Company, which is a research and production farm up here in Minnesota. And my background is also in academia. I did my doctoral research at the University of Minnesota for strawberry season extension using organic practices in the upper Midwest. And then I went on to work with Mary looking at spotted wing Drosophila, that nasty little invasive insect that every small fruit grower hates. And then after that, I started my own research and production farm with the intent of continuing the work of uh, small farmer oriented research more at the small farmer scale. And that started in 2018. And we just closed on our very own farm this past August. So uh, in the process of moving everything over, it's been a massive undertaking, but I can't wait for it to be done. My name is Richard Barnes. I'm the founder and manager of Tanglewood Berry Farm in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, we've uh, been growing produce uh, for about 20 years right now. Uh, our specialty are uh, berries. We've been growing strawberries and researching with strawberries uh, for about six years right now. We grow on benches uh, in the field in high tunnels and in greenhouses. And we started with um, with day neutral. Uh, just last year, we did uh, begin some research with the uh, short day varieties for uh, high tunnel and um, greenhouse growing. Mary, could you tell us a little bit more of the general strawberry production in Minnesota? Like most of our audience are probably from Indiana. I think we want to know how the strawberry okay. are growing other places. Yeah, um, so there's not a lot <laughs> of strawberry production in Minnesota comparatively, you know, um, just getting back from California, it's nothing like that. Um, and most of the growers are still kind of doing these short day perennial matted row systems, but we're seeing this sort of change. I think there's a little more interest now in the day neutral production. Um, there's certainly a lot of demand for local, uh, locally produced berries. Um, and I think Andy can speak to that. We've had a big, you know, uh, industry player get into the game recently. So Bushel Boy farms within the last couple of years is now growing day neutral strawberry and uh, in their indoor greenhouse facilities and vertical um, kind of vertical growth systems hydroponically. So um, I think that's been going well for them. So, yeah, I think that that there's there's unmet um, demand for some of these high quality locally grown berries here and fruit in general <laughs> is, is there's market opportunity there. Just like what Mary was saying, day neutral strawberry production, especially in the upper Midwest, is still fairly small. But like she mentioned, the demand is massive. Um, we'll probably talk about markets a little bit later, but I can say that since 2018, I have never gone to a single farmer's market where my day neutral strawberries have not sold out. And if you're in a metropolitan, near a metropolitan area, there's usually a lot of farmer's markets as well. So we have not even close to saturated the demand, even at the farmer's market level for these really high quality fruits. So it's it's very exciting and it's, it's a privilege to be able to research to try to make it more accessible for growers in the region. My feeling in Indiana is 
We have a few uh, metal roll productions. I see majority of them is doing UPIC, and it's some of the new alternative systems farmers are trying that, and is that to bring fruit to farmers market. Is, is that the same case in Minnesota? Yeah, the vast majority of strawberry production here is still UPIC, and they use the June bearing production. Um, and because day neutrals are a little bit more finicky in order to get them to work well, you usually have to invest a little bit more in the infrastructure side, especially if you go on controlled environment, if tunnels or or uh, caterpillar tunnels or anything like that. It's the that presence of the infrastructure makes it a little bit more vulnerable to you pick, but uh, still really, really good for farmers markets. So you'll have a little bit extra cost in terms of you need to pay the labor to pick them for you at the market, but fortunately the demand is so great and the willingness to pay is also quite high. So it, it's been working out so far um, with the day neutrals. Now goes to day neutrals. We have been mentioned that several times, but um, Mary, I want to ask you this question. What are day neutral strawberries and why day neutral strawberries? <laughs> Um, so, so we say day neutral um, because the, the plants aren't sensitive to day length. So that means that they'll continuously flower and fruit um, for an extended amount of time, provided that the you know, temperature conditions are right. When it gets too hot, they kind of they shut down a little bit and set, they stop flowering. But in Minnesota, day neutral varieties typically produce fruit from July through October or until we have a killing frost. Um, so that's in contrast to the short day varieties or, you know, the June bearing, as we call them. Um, so the, those only initiate flowering um, under those short day conditions. So the day length has to be less than 14 hours. And then the harvest period is, is abbreviated. So we get fruit from four to six weeks from early June through mid-July. So, so basically the, the, you know, day neutral varieties allow for uh, an extended production season, which, so you get more fruit <laughs> over a longer period of time, which is great for markets where people want fruit all, all of the time, right? The, the challenges, but there's challenges there <laughs> to that extended season. And so, you know, labor is one of them and sex and diseases can be another one. So, so there's kind of pros and cons. I think, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear from Andy and Richard and the growers who are who are doing this commercially on, on um, how this makes sense from from a production standpoint? But yeah, <laughs> there's one one thing I would add is, and this is just general. I've noticed at the farmers markets is you'll have a lot of consumers use the term ever bearing, and botanically uh, they are distinct. Genetically, ever bearing and day neutral strawberries are distinct in terms of their flowering habits. Ever bearing are more of an obligate long day and they don't have as much photo period insensitivity, but it's gotten to the point where you just kind of use the terms interchangeably when you're talking to consumers, but just knowing that ever bearings are distinct from day neutrals, they're different cultivars, they're different flowering habits, there's different genetics that lead to the uh, photo period inductions. And I, there are differences too. Um, I mean, growing day neutrals, we typically grow annually. And sometimes people will ask, well, can you, can you overwinter them to get, <laughs> um, and, and then it, I, so there's been there's been some work. We've never tried it really here. I think that the thinking, is, the thought is that they're, we're pushing them so hard in this first year of production to fruit, to flower and fruit continuously that they're not the plants are not able to put a lot of um, kind of energy into the crowns and, and overwintering. And so, um, but but in the in folks researchers at University of New Hampshire have shown that. Um, with some protection, <laughs> they can get into a year two and they and they can do okay. But then anything that kind of after that seems like the production declines. And so it really, uh, it, I guess it just makes sense for how you're going to fit this in strawberries into your production system. So I, I'm thinking annual day neutral varieties work really well or they're well adapted to farmers who are growing vegetables. Yeah, um, and so this is another way to potentially diversify. Andy, could you describe your current production system? I'll try to make it as quick as possible. So I grow a little bit in a complicated method. I call them fruit factories. It's actually based on a research grant that I got from the Department of Agriculture. But so imagine caterpillar tunnels, which are kind of smaller 
high tunnels and I'm growing in caterpillar tunnels just because I want to create a system that's uh, accessible for young and beginning and emerging farmer groups. So they're easy to construct and they're easy to move, which is very important for people who are leasing land. They're just a little bit smaller. But I've modified these caterpillar tunnels for insect exclusion. So every entry, exit, and ventilation point has insect netting on it. And inside these modified tunnels, I have three rows of strawberries. And each row actually has three tiers of strawberries growing in it. So I have strawberries growing in the ground. So on raised beds using soil as the media and sort of as a traditional day neutral strawberry production system. And then on top of that ground strawberries, I have two layers of container production. So I have gutters growing on top of that ground strawberries. And when we do it this way, we can really increase the density of production in a relatively small space. So inside a 16 foot by 100 foot tunnel, we can fit almost 2000 plants. So in the open field, that's the equivalent of using 28% the physical space to grow the same number of plants. So it's really nice for growers who want to reduce their physical footprint or maybe don't have access to a whole land, a whole lot of uh, land themselves. So historically, we'll plant around May 15th up here in the upper Midwest. That has been due personally to uh, our landlord control of our irrigation system. But now that I have my own land, I'm going to experiment with planting earlier in the season. And this is gonna be more possible for us because we have tunnels where we're not gonna have to worry about the spring frost as much. So I'm gonna strive for May 1st, but it'll obviously be dependent on the extended, extended forecast around that time of year in 2024. And so for our stuff in the ground, we used to just use ground soil. And for our container production, we use something called uh, Lambert mix. It's the specifically, if anyone's interested, it's Lambert mix LM-111. And we've had a very good success with that. We plant in early to mid-May and we start our harvests in late June. And the way that it works, because we don't remove our flowers, is we have a pretty good first flush in late June into July. The yield dips going into August, but then as we get more and more branch crowns on the fruit, we actually experience our peak season in late August all the way through the end of September. And then as we start getting temperature and daylight limited in October, yields start to drop all the way through October. And there have been years where we've harvested as late as November 15th was our latest harvest ever. So we use tunnels, we use a hybrid system that uses soil and soilless and we are able to harvest around 20 to 24 weeks a year. That sounds amazing. And the, well, what is your goal of your yield? I don't know how you typically think of that per plant or per entire tunnel with that three layers. Yeah, there's, there's so many ways to look at it, right? You can do it per plant, you can do it per square, like row, foot of row within, and you can do it per tunnel. But on average right now, we're striving in our system to get around a pound of fruit per plant. And another thing that we're looking at is obviously the quality of the fruit. So we try to go for at least 10 degrees bricks per berry um, in order to keep that sweetness really high. So you said you are targeting one pound per plant. And in the 16 by 100 foot cat tunnel, you have 2,000 plants. That is 2,000 pounds of strawberries you are targeting. That's, that's the goal, yes. And in an, in an open field environment that has really high fertility, you will be able to get more than a pound per plant if you have a really good year. But um, with our system, a pound has been working pretty well. You mentioned earlier a little bit you sell at farmer's market. Is, do you have other market avenues? Um, so... Uh, we make farmer's market production, and we also have a couple of wholesale uh, food hubs that we sell to as well. In terms of revenue from the fruit, we do fresh, and we also have a very uh, considerable cottage food uh, license as well, where we make a lot of processed goods using our early week yields and also our grade B fruits. We make a lot of jams, we make a lot of syrups, we make shrubs for making mixed drinks, and also fruit leather, which is kind of like a fruit roll-up that the consumers really, really like. Thanks, Andy. Um, Richard, can you tell us about your production? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, we don't grow anything in the ground. Uh, we have uh, developed a bench system. And um, a typical bench 
uh, would be, say, 100 feet in length and a little less than four feet wide. Uh, on that bench, we have a density of 400 approximately um, uh, bags. We use one gallon cloth bags. We use about three liters of um, substrate, which would consist of um, coconut core, uh, sphagnum moss, and some perlite in different ratios. Uh, each bag has a drip emitter uh, in, in the bag. And then we uh, feed the plants through an injector, water-soluble, uh, balanced um, fertilizer. And we also need to treat our water. We have very high uh, alkaline uh, uh, water, high pH. So we we have uh, we do inject some acid to bring it down to about a uh, six point two to six point five, somewhere in that range. Um, we uh, we typically we're we're. We're changing a bit now because we've expanded with our infrastructure. We we now have a a, a greenhouse and uh, we added another tunnel this year. So uh, what we have been doing is we would start uh, like this last season. I'll speak about we we planted uh, the first week of March. Uh, uh, strawberries. It was variety Albion, a day neutral, and they were bare root plants. So we we planted those um, in in a greenhouse in trays, and then we replanted into our bags. And um, eight weeks later, uh, which uh, close to eight weeks, it was around the end of April. And then and then we can move them out into the field on the benches. Our benches have um, uh, roll down poly uh, uh, over the top, which, which gives some uh, cold protection for frost. Uh, it's not significant, but it does help, especially with the wind and um, light frost. Uh, this year we had, um, we were scrambling. We had an unexpected uh, frost in uh, May and um, it didn't appear to damage the plants much, but it, it, it did some damage to the crowns and it, it did affect the, uh, the yields um, on, on those. Um, but we will typically start harvesting um, in uh, toward the end of May. Uh, we do pinch back uh, uh, significantly the the flower buds and runners. Um, it's it's rather easy on the benches. Everything's a tabletop height, so so that that does make it relatively easy to to maintain those. And then uh, we continue with harvest uh, clear up into uh, this year. It was the end of uh, end of October. Uh, on those benches and we we pick every two to three days and we pick consistently uh you know all, all through those those months on um, harvest uh we sell uh we have a farm stand at our farm uh, as i mentioned earlier we do we have other berries we uh, specialize in blackberries raspberries blueberries and strawberries uh, we don't grow any vegetable produce. It's just berries. And so we have a, a farm stand and um, a pretty good following of people. We are in the city limits of Fort Wayne. We're on the southwest side. Um, so, you know, we have a, there's a dense population. And um, as Andy was saying, there's a, a really large demand that we haven't even begun to, uh, to satisfy yet. And then we... We started doing farmers markets uh, last year uh, as our uh, yields of increase. And as Andy was saying, we we just can't keep up. I mean, we will we will they'll be lined up before we're open and we'll sell out in an hour and a half of all the berries that we take down. So there's just a, a huge, huge demand for uh, for the, the fruit, especially the strawberries. Yeah, we also do bare root cuttings of the Albion, um, and we choose Albion. We've done 
a lot of research up here in Minnesota on the different cultivars that work up here. And Albion is not the highest yielding cultivar. Um, if, if you're concerned mostly with yield, I would recommend a, a, a cultivar like Portola, which is very high yield and gives large uh, fruit. But Albion consistently has the highest bricks content, uh, subjectively tastes the best to me, has a really nice flavor profile, um, can stay nice and firm for a couple days after harvest, which is nice too. And when we're marketing a very high value, high quality product, we just need it to taste the best. So I'm I'm fine with not getting as high yields as possible if I can pr provide the highest quality, highest, best tasting product possible. There is another cultivar called Cabrillo that's been recently released. It sort of has the taste profile of Albion and uh, the yield profile of Portola, which seems like the best of both worlds. The issue is it's difficult to get in smaller quantities. Our, our, our supplier previously adjusted their minimum order to 30,000 plants minimum if they're going to ship it to Minnesota. And right now we don't need that many plants. So I'm looking for uh, Cabrillo and other places, but it's another great one to look into if you have access to it, but Albion is what we use uh, primarily. Yeah, well, I uh, concur with Andy. Uh, you know, when you're face to face with the customer and selling local, you you want flavor. I mean, they they'll overlook the uh, the size of the berry and and other things, but you you most definitely need the flavor. And um, Albion seems to be pretty consistent. We in the past we've trialed some um, different berries, uh, day neutral, different varieties. Um, but uh, Albion just, you know, it's not everything, but it, but it's, uh, but it it seems to be the best, and what it does do, it's consistent. Richard, I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, but when you're talking about the farmers markets, I've actually noticed the the consumers up here prefer the smaller fruit to medium sized fruit over the large fruit, and I think it's because they associate the large fruit with the store bought. Uh, mm -hmm. Driscoll stuff that up here in Minnesota, by the time it makes it up here, sometimes it can be, you know, over 10 days old and it just doesn't taste nearly as good as fresh picked. They associate the smaller fruit with, you know, wild strawberries that they picked maybe, maybe with a memory of picking strawberries mm -hmm. growing up. And, and honestly, they, they, they do taste the same, the small and the large, but the, the consumers prefer the small and medium sized fruit to the point that we've started like hiding the large berries in the bottom of the container yeah. so that the consumers don't see them until it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah. We, we see that same phenomenon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's interesting. You mentioned that. And the, I typically, my feeling is the small fruit. Mm, yes. Some it tastes good, but it's kind of soft. It makes the handling more difficult. If, especially if you need to go into farmer's market, is that would be a problem for you? Um, we get the we get the fruit to the farmer's market within 24 hours of harvest, so we haven't had an issue with that yet. And Albion's naturally a little bit firmer, so I haven't seen a relationship between the size of the fruit and the ability of it to hold its shape by the time we get to market. And uh, and when it's small, you need to put more effort of harvest. That's request for the labor. Is that would be a problem? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it takes a little bit more. Um, a little thing about the strawberry architecture, you know, you have these flower clusters. And as you get further down the king flower, that first flower, the size of the fruit gets smaller. And since they all harvest at a different rate, you'll have one week where you just have massive fruit, right? Because it's all the king flowers that ripened. And then the next couple of weeks after that, the size of the fruit will get smaller because you're getting the fruit ripened from those secondary and tertiary flowers. Okay. Yeah. My understanding for growing day nutrients, you one of the challenges you are facing is in the summer. As we all know, strawberry don't like the high temperatures. And, uh, and it seems to me you mentioned your um, the yield is dropped July, right? Like how long is the time you don't harvest much and how you deal with the summer heat? So our yields drop, um, yeah, sort of later July through August. And I believe it's a it's a quantitative issue. There's multiple factors leading to it. A huge factor that has nothing to do with, with uh, heat is just the architecture of the plant, right? It's 
in that first flush, you get the you get that first crowns worth of strawberries, and then it's also developing those branch crowns. And in between June, early July, and uh, late August and September, it's transitioning from that first flush into making those branch crowns uh, and those branch crowns make their own flower clusters as well. So the dip is definitely part of the natural growth habit of the strawberry itself, but heat does play a role as well. And like I said, we go in tunnels. So there are, I was worried that the heat would be a bigger issue than it actually ended up being for us in those tunnels, because I've, you you read that once you get above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, especially the pollen starts becoming unviable, but then other aspects of the strawberry can become un unviable over longer periods as well. Um, we haven't noticed any difference uh, in between our open field controls with our uh, tunnel production, even though it's considerably hotter in the tunnels. And I'm not positive why my hypothesis would be, I suspect the, you know, the heat leading to the reduced yields is actually a combination of higher heats with also higher ultraviolet intensity that is associated with higher heats. And because we're growing in tunnels that filter out a lot of that UV radiation, uh, we aren't noticing the uh, the dried out flower, the aborted flower clusters or inviable pollen that you would normally associate with similar heats in the open field just because you don't have the associated ultraviolet radiation as well. Now, I don't have any way, I didn't, haven't tested that. That's just my working hypothesis based on the fact that I'm noticing uh, a higher proportion of viability, even at higher temperatures when I'm inside my tunnels. The, the, the most difficult thing, honestly, is just harvesting when you're at, in those high temperatures in the tunnels. And so we just have to harvest as, as early in the day as possible. And we try to wrap up, honestly, before 11 a.m. when it gets super hot up here. Do you use shade? Uh, we don't use shade. We just have the tunnels. I am working on adjusting the uh, tunnels as well to have insect netting that goes the entire length of the tunnel as well. So I can bring up the sides of the caterpillar tunnels and still have the insect exclusion, uh, but still having a little bit more uh, ventilation and, and air circulation in the tunnels to reduce the temps. Richard, can you... Can you see something of your summer production and the challenges in the summer you are facing? Yeah, well, um, you know, every, every every season's a little bit different. Um, this last season, we we didn't we didn't have the extreme temperatures as much as what we've had previously here in Fort Wayne. Um, and when we did have those, it was typically in June, and it just kind of landed in a in a good spot. But we, our berries produce, our plants produce clear through the season pretty consistently. Um, the, the flavor held up very well to where previous years, um, we would start losing some flavor if it get very, very hot. Um, and we, we would have the, the, you know, pollen, you know, with the real high heat and the combination of humidity. Um, but this year we were, we were fairly uh, consistent. Um, we, with, with our bench system, we do have, we, we are able to put shade uh, cloth uh, on, on those, on the benches. Um, we didn't need, we didn't use that this year at all. Uh, a couple previous years we have, and, and that, that does help. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it, it it it's a concern for sure, and uh, you're kind of at the mercy of the of the weather, right? And um, what's you know what what that brings to you, you gotta just kind of deal with them. In the summer, always the times the insects pass is it's most. Yeah. So Mary, you you work with several growers. Can you can you comment on that? What what are the pests farmers are encountering? Right. Yeah. Um, so I would say for, for the day neutral strawberries, the biggest pest of concern is ligus bug <laughs> for sure. Um, and that's, I think that's true wherever they're grown. Um, so it's not just a, you know, a regional thing. Um, 
So these, you know, the insects have piercing sucking mouth parts. And so they feed on the, they feed early, the damage is done early. They feed on the developing very, very early in its development. So primarily on the kind of reproductive parts of the strawberry plants. So including the achenes and um, the flesh around the achenes. And so that causes distorted kind of misshapen fruit. It can cause excess seediness at the tips of the fruit and what we call cat facing. So it's the seediness plus like puckering and, and distortion. So you get, you also get smaller berries. So they don't, they don't reach their full size potential. So that kind of limits yield in that way, but it's, it's a, it's a marketability issue um, primarily. And they can be difficult to, they can be difficult to manage because um because the damage happens early and we don't see it until, you know, the fruit is ready to be harvested. So it almost re requires like a, a conventional spray program where you're spraying almost across the entire season, unless you're going to do something like a controlled environment or an exclusion kind of practice to keep them out. Um, I think location kind of matters too. I mean, like um, tarnished plant bug are generalists and, um, where there's alfalfa or other host plants being grown, you can kind of get a spillover effect. And so that can have um, an effect on the population pressure that growers are facing. So it might be worse in some areas um, than others, but it, it tends to be generally bad. <laughs> At least up here, it's, it's a challenge. Um, other problems, um, two spotted spider mite feeding can, this year we had it really bad. Um, and I think it was because of the hot, dry, temperatures that we had. Um, and populations got in some in some of our field plots so high that the plants died. And so that really limited yield. Um, thrips can sometimes be a problem. They cause they can cause when when the populations are high enough, they can cause that bronzing or kind of streaking on the fruit. So it's a kind it's um maybe not quite a I mean I, I guess they they also feed on pollen too. Um, so potentially yield limiting, but more of a marketable fruit quality issue. And then spotted wing drosophila, I've been studying this one for a while. Andy studied it when he was here as a postdoc working in the lab. It's strawberries are a host fruit for sure, but they tend not to be as quite as bad <laughs> on day neutral strawberries as they are on other fruit like raspberries. And maybe Richard has comments on that as well, because I, I know he grows a variety of fruit, it sounds like. So um, but it is, it's still one that's on our radar and, and um, because the larvae can cause, uh, when they're in the fruit and they're feeding um, sunken spots and mushy spots um, on the fruit, which can kind of, kind of destroy the marketability of that, of that fruit. And then now I, it sounds like yellow jackets too, are, <laughs> can come in in the fall. And, and it's one that we've noticed too um, in our fields as well, you know, looking for sugar late in the summer. And, and I, it would be interesting, Richard. I don't know if it's more of a. These are so obvious, and they're and they're a you know yellow jackets uh, and paper wasps. We don't want to be near them when we're picking. We don't want to get stung. Um, so if, if the nuisance factor and that kind of harvest risk outweighs the the fruit damage, I don't know. Or where does that line up? So anyway, it'll be it'll be interesting. It's interesting to hear that that's that's been a problem and, and um, something to keep our eyes on. I think. Richard, do you have anything at you grow them in the outside? I assume past this, so uh, one of the cha major challenges for you in the summers. Uh, yeah. Well, you know the the wasp, as Mary was mentioning, and I brought up earlier with the um, late summer. Um, again, it it varies year to year, but it's 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 uh, it, it they are there every year. Um, we we haven't had uh, issues with the uh, SWD, spotwing drosophila, with the strawberries. But boy, do they ever love blackberries. <laughs> and um, we we were a certified organic uh, farm until about two years ago. And we could not get through a complete season of blackberries, um, even using, you know, what limited sprays there were and staying on top of it, spraying every five to seven days with uh, OMRI certified um, products. Uh, we could not get through that. So um, we, with our raspberries, not so much. I think it's the timing of, of, the, of the year because we, we do a spring uh, 
harvest as well as the fall. And strawberries, we haven't noticed, but we do spray. I mean, we do kind of stay ahead of it. We have, uh, uh, you know, sticky traps all through, and we keep an eye on the, uh, you know, when the uh, density becomes a certain level, we we spray. And um, we'll, we use organic sprays uh, as much as we can, I'll say that. But with the um, the blackberries and the spotted wing drosophila, we just could not control it. So we'll... Uh, we use a not a, a restricted use, uh, but we we do use uh, a product that's uh, that's not organic certified for that. Um, yeah, and the other the the strawberries again on the benches they just I mean that eliminates I think a lot of the uh, the insect issues that we have. Um, you know you don't get the ground bugs. Uh, we have a lot of. Uh, Air movement, ventilation through our benches, uh, that's good also for fungal disease. Um, so I, we, uh, you know, we, it's controllable, you know, what we have. And we just, we don't have a lot of seconds either, berries. We, uh, you know, we we also, as Andy was saying, we, we do some jams uh, uh, with some of our other fruits, but uh, we, I don't think we had a uh, maybe five pounds of seconds and strawberries this year that we uh, that we could even turn into jam or anything. Where the other berries, yeah, we certainly have have plenty. And you are growing them in tunnels and with screening, so I'm assuming some of those pests is excluded, but spider mites would be a major issue. I'm assuming. Yeah, in the tunnels. Um... Tarnished plant bug has become a non-issue, which is huge because we've gone from having to spray one to two times a week to spraying zero times a season uh, to control tarnished plant bug, which is really nice. Um, and the SWD is also very low. But yeah, the spider mites and the thrips have become a larger issue in the tunnels because spider mites and thrips love hot and dry environments. And that's what you've got inside a tunnel like this. So... What I sort of tinkered with a tiny bit this year is uh, biocontrol. So I purchased um, these sachets of BioLine Starsky 500s, and I uh, anecdotally noticed a decent amount of success with them. So I'm actually writing a grant to formalize the use of biocontrol sachets in uh uh, controlled environment caterpillar tunnels for strawberry production. And hopefully I can investigate that a lot more and then we can eliminate uh, those uh, problems as well. And then maybe not have to use any sprays inside the tunnels ever, which would be uh, a personal goal of mine. Okay. Um, okay, we talk about insects. How about disease? Andy and Richard, do you want to comment on that? What, what are the diseases you are fighting? Uh, well, you know, an anthracnose is, is always uh, uh, an, an issue. It's that's one thing with day neutral. Uh, you know, when you you have year, there's always bloom. <laughs> you know, from from beginning to end, and of course, that's when a lot of the the disease, um, fungal disease, will uh, will take hold. You know, when they're in blossom, and so you, you do you do need to spray regularly uh, we found you know to to keep that in check um we started using last year a, a copper product that's omri certified and um it's uh we we use that as our as our go to um but w we spray we spray depending on the weather but Every seven to ten days, uh, we're spraying a fungicide. Um, you know, and, and we may, uh, you know, depending the state of the plants, you know, we may put a, a, a foliar nutrient uh, mix in it. You know, develop a cocktail and 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 um, you know take take care of that at the same time. But um, yeah, that's the the so I'd say batitrus with. We noticed with the copper spray that uh, it almost eliminated with titrus. I we didn't have any that I recall this this season at all. 
Um, it did a, a really great job with that. Um, and um, yeah, so th those are the those are the two main ones. I think towards the end of the the season, you know, the plants really get tired. You know, they've been producing for about five months, and and um, we may get some, uh, you know, leaf brown spot. Um, I think there there may be some some other um, fungal issues, but it's late in the issue, in the season, and we we choose not to, you know you know, take care of that much. But every year, as a matter of fact, that's what I'm doing this week is our, our bags are like a cloth bag. And so we, we, you know, we wash the bags every year and sanitize. And, you know, that's very important, you know, with container growing, that I believe to start out with, you know, with really uh, clean, sanitized uh, uh, growing media for sure. Uh, the vessel that you're growing in, uh, surroundings and that they get started off with that it really eliminates a lot of the, the problems and of course healthy plants I mean that's that's a, a no-brainer you really need to uh, you know bring in good stock yeah just to piggyback on Richard uh, when you're using uh, container production you're almost naturally going to have a little bit less disease pressure than growing in the ground in an open field um, and because I'm in tunnels, not in the open field at all, I have even less pressure for the diseases. Uh, for, for most fungal infections, you need standing water on the plant itself in order for the infection to occur, or at very least it catalyzes the rate of infection. And if you're able to keep the plants dry in a lower humidity environment, you're just naturally going to have much less uh, fungal infection, even if the pressure is there. So we have not had much pressure at all inside the tunnels. Uh, towards the end of the season, just like what Richard said, we do have a little bit of a uh, botrytis and powdery mildew just because it's late in the season. We think the strawberries are tired. It got a little bit wet later in the season here for us. And to, to tamp down on that a tiny bit, I sprayed a little bit of oxidate, which I have no issue spraying because it's basically just a, it's a stronger hydrogen peroxide solution. And honestly, that's what I use to sanitize the containers at the end of every year as well. So I do about an ounce of oxidate per gallon in a, in a backpack sprayer and I hit the plants with them. It's a really nice addition also to lower the pH of a tank solution, if anyone's interested in that, because uh, sprays like Pyganic really like a lower pH. And if you have a high pH well water, like 7.58, the, the ox, uh, like things like Pyganic don't do well. So if you mix it with uh, Oxidate, it's a nice way of adding a little bit of antifungal to your tank mixture and also reduces the pH so that uh, something like Pyganic can work a lot better as well. So uh we do a little bit of oxidate, but yeah, in general, the, the fungal pressure has been pretty low for us inside the tunnels. There's a, a a new pathogen that's kind of emerged on the scene for strawberries <laughs> that a lot of growers, I, we haven't seen it here, but it's um, Neopestiloshiopsis. <laughs> and it's it's been in Florida and California and co collaborators um, that I'm working with at the University of Wisconsin have found it there. And th the thinking is, is that it's, it's been spread through nursery stock when we buy, you know, our bare root plants um, that we could be unintentionally spreading it or it comes in infected from the nursery. So it's one that it's, it causes leaf spots and fruit rot. So it's another fruit rotting pathogen. And um, it can, I guess, spread pretty quickly if it, if it's not kept in check. And so it's, it's one that's on our radars <laughs> and we hope not to have it. Um, but yeah. Uh, we don't, we also don't know a lot right now at this point, I think of how, how it survives um, in, in field conditions. So it's interesting yeah. you mentioned that Mary, actually I work with Dr. Dan Eagle. He's our plant pathologist. He's studying this disease. Okay. We did some cultivar trials and I believe I remember it turns out to ambulance pretty susceptible on this pest, but we haven't yeah. because not many farmers here really grow that scale the nutrients so we haven't really seen it in a commercial production yet. I do want to mention a little bit of what I saw um, for the nutrients in my region. And what is your harvest room are? USDA harvest room, is that you are at room four, five? Yeah, 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 four A, I believe, Mary. 
four, huh? Yeah. yeah. Rachel, you are at five, right? Yes. I'm at six. I'm in Southern Indiana. And I want to say a little bit of what I have tried of the grown day neutrals. I, I tried several things. Um, at the beginning, I was doing the similar things as Richard and Andy did, bare root planted in the spring. At, at the year I tried it, it works great. I planted them in March and I started to harvest in, in middle May and uh, until the end of June. I tried to use those retractable node tunnels. And what I see is the node tunnels increase the, no, the, the node tunnels extended the early harvest for about a week, but not really increase the spring yield. But still, I thought it's very exciting. Like I'm able to harvest about the best cultivar I can have is the 0.4 pounds per plant. Um, just think about the plant in March that to harvest in May, um, and you can get that yield. It's pretty exciting for me. But I have tried this for a few years, and uh, be note I'm at a vegetable farm, and I always, always failed of controlling weeds in the summer. <laughs> And we, we 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 don't have that energy to like I grow them in the ground at the beginning. We don't have the energy to control the weeds. So a few years I tried, I almost did not get much yield in the fall at all. <laughs> so that that's one thing I tried of the new church at the beginning. And then uh, the next thing I tried is I, I was thinking, is that possible? I not grow bare root in the ground. I grow tree plants. Um, so I started early in the greenhouse to grow a tree plants, and I'm thinking to move them to the ground if I could get a higher spring harvest. And it turns out um, I'm not. The tree plants, when I move them, like I grow them in greenhouse in the winter, and as a tree plants, I planted them in March in the open field. At the same time, I, I planted the bare root. It end up as the bare root actually established much much better than the tree plants, um, because of the cold and the tree plants is very sensitive. Um, it's almost the cold killed all the new leaves and the tree plant have to start over. So it earned up the bare root plants would establish better. So that is a feature. Um, then I also tried the tree plants. I grow them in bench system, grow them in a high tunnel, and then. Like, of course, the, the, the bloom in very early March. I don't have problem to protect those blooms when I'm growing plants in soil. However, on the bench systems with row covers, I won't be able to protect those blooms. So it turned out also that approach is failed um, in an unheated high tunnel. I cannot be able to protect those early blooms to get the um, early yield. One thing I do see relatively successful is I'm growing in the plaque plants in uh, inside of the tunnel and planted in the fall. Um, one so in that system is if folks familiar with um, plastic culture system, it's the same same system. I just move them inside of the uh, inside of the high tunnel. And in that system, um, I plant not just the, the neutral cultivars. I also planted. Um, short day cultivars. Um, and what I see on the day neutral is when I planted the, the plaques in September, I start to harvest in October. Um, and I'm using row cover trying to protect those blooms um, in, in, in the fall. And one year I'm be able to pick in, in even in the early January. Then I just failed to protect this bloom anymore in, in the deep winter. Um, however, if I'm looking at the yield of my full harvest compared to my spring harvest, the full harvest is very, very minimal. So in the later years, I just gave up of trying to protect those blooms in November, December, just, just, just let it go. So I can pick a little bit of uh, fruit from the day neutrals in the fall, but majority of them um, is in the spring. And those day neutrals, they do start to blooming and uh, give me fruit early in the season. In my case, the, I mean early, that is, I start to harvest in middle April. And majority of those early cultivars in the tunnel, it's from the neutrals. However, um, 
I, we, we do in the system, we identified a few um, the neutral cultivars did very good, especially the one I noted is Sandrio. I'm not a super fan of Ambion in the system um, because of the yield is low. Um, I'm not extend the harvest as typically you grow the nutrients, so the high yield it's pretty important I think for farmers to make this work. Sandra have a high yield, and also some of the other actually marketed as short day, but it have low shear requirement, and and those early cultivars like um like Florida radiance, it's a typical cultivar, it have the highest yield in the this system. I described. I just want to share with our audience of some of the things about the nutrients I tried in my region, which is a little southern compared to Richard and Andy. We didn't mention, uh, we didn't talk about runnering. You know, it, it, it's been something uh, here that uh, it's a challenge for production, right? So, so strawberries want to runner. We don't want the neutral strawberries to runner because we want them to put their energy and carbohydrates into producing flowers and fruit and not um, propagating themselves in an annual system. So um, uh, so runner removal is done by hand and it adds it adds to the labor. And so um, one of the things we're trying to, to figure out here is how frequently does it need to happen? Does it have to happen across the entire season? Um, how can we do this faster? I, I know there's um, folks that are still thinking, you know, coming on a, this recent trip in California, they're still trying to figure out how to automate little things, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> and we might not be there for a while. And so, um, yeah, I, it, I would be interested in getting, I think, Andy and Richard's opinions on, on runner management and, and is it easier or faster to do this in a system with, you know, tabletop productions or in controlled environment systems? Yeah, well, that that is important, and um, we uh, we typically about three times per season, um, the growing season, as we'll go through and renovate the the plants. And uh, you're absolutely right. It it on the bench top, it it's not that laborious. Um, you know the the way we're set up to do it, and as we go through. Uh, we also um, would possibly pinch some of the smaller blossoms while we're at that plant. Uh, of course, remove the runners and the dead leaves, which, you know, build up. But in a typical growing five month growing season, we'll go through uh, three times and and do that. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it, it's really not that that much labor with the bench system in you know, in the scheme of things. Okay. It obviously takes time and, um, you know, to do that, but we just use some little real small pruning shears and go through and the, uh, the guys can be, they're quite proficient at, uh, at, at, at doing that. But I think that's, that's the key too for reducing the disease, right? Uh, you've got a much cleaner canopy, um, which adds to the quality of the fruit and, um, you know, it's, and, which to me, it, it's not, it wouldn't be practical to do this on the ground if, if, if you were there. I can't imagine. We, we've tried it with some research to do it, and it's just, uh, it's very difficult. Yeah. And the plants are generally not in as good a shape uh, as, as the, the bench ones would be. So it just, they just take more, more attention in general. Yeah. Well, this wouldn't be a proper podcast, I think, if there wasn't at least one shameless plug, and I'm going to throw it in right now. So uh, later on in the winter, in the off season, I'm going to host my own webinar, actually on Instagram Live. And this year, I took metrics on yield of my tunnel versus the open field and labor. And I split up the labor between harvest labor and management labor. And by combining those two metrics... I was able to create something called the yield labor metric, which is essentially how many minutes of labor do you have to put per plant to get one pound of fruit from that plant? And we can compare how much better or worse it is in the tunnel, picking all the runners and doing other management things versus in the open field. And 
I'm going to do that later in the year. So if anyone follows me on Instagram, you can tune in and listen to our results. And I'm only giving that tease because I haven't finished the analysis yet because I'm in the process of moving, but I will finish it soon. And I can't wait to talk about it and share it with as many people as possible. And now you have to because you promised this to us all. So exactly, it's gonna happen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, Andy. So I guess in your podcast we will talk more of the economics. So Rachel, can you share a little of your your view vision on the economic aspect on this business? What What's your thoughts? Um. Yeah. We. Um. I have to admit, I've we've been you know kind of. Uh, sloppy, if you will, in, in recording and capturing our exact cost over the season. You know, we can, we can go in and do a time study for, you know, each, each task, which, which we've done. But um, you know, growing the five different berries that we grow and it, all kinds of the dollars go into a pot <laughs> at the end of the year either make money or you don't but but we are getting better at that we we're getting a uh, a new uh, a point of sale system uh, this year that allow us to track not only the the specifics of of what we're selling at, at what price and and so forth but some other uh, capturing labor and so forth so we are getting much much better at that um it yeah we you know, as we, as we mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a big demand. We get a very high price, I think, for, for our berries. We're getting um, 7 to 7.50 a quart um, and um, for, for the strawberries. Um, we are making money with it, uh, but um, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not at the point right now to, to give you exact numbers on, on anything. But we're we we are um, you know we've invested uh, in a in a new greenhouse and a uh, a uh, tunnel uh, this year uh, to add to our others and we're uh, really committed now with the strawberry uh, project and you know not only are we uh, you know working farm you know for profit but we want to continue doing research also which which we've done. And uh, you know quite a bit of that in the past, and uh, contribute. And I think I think Andy and I are like souls in that regard because he's he well, is really targeting you know what's going to be practical for the small growers and so forth. And that that's where we're coming from. Also, you know we 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 want to share you know what what we learn and uh, and uh, you know pass that on for for other other people to the benefit from. Thanks, Richard, Andy, and Mary. I think this is a great discussion. I'm looking forward to his ended programs and learn more of your, well, what you learned and uh, well, what, what you're finding from your research, too. And also, Richard, we will continue our studies. We, we work together in Indiana to looking for ways to help small farmers grow strawberries. Thank you so many for your participation and discussion on this program today. And thanks everyone coming to participate live. We'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you.